but uh, yeah, again, I, uh, I appreciate uh, everyone engaging with this book um, and taking on this time and, and engaging with the book club um, and, you know, getting on the Slack channel. And I mean, I, there's a lot of things that we had to do to get this all to happen, um, which I know that the community organizers did a lot of that as well. Um, but um, everyone here um, and those, you know, I know this is recorded. So those who have come at any time during this, um, we appreciate uh, you and, and hope that there can be another cohort. Um, and I, I, that'd be really cool to participate in the next cohort as well, just to kind of listen in. So um, <clears throat> with that, I'm going to share my first ever, uh, however you pronounce it, slides, the X, you know, how do you, I still don't know how to pronounce that. Um, but I copied whoever, I copied Josh who copied uh, Car Carla, Carla. Um, so this theme is now part of, our, part of our book club. So, um, but so we're wrapping up this week um, in the last three chapters, uh, 17, 18, and 19. Um, <clears throat> and we're just gonna hit some of the big topics. And then I've got a couple of probing questions um, uh, on some of those topics. <clears throat> and then I wanna talk about kind of how we can then share some of the stuff that we've learned um, and reaching out to community about you know, future communities, you know, whatever, if there's a next cohort or just the data science uh, community in general. So, <clears throat> so in chapters uh, 17, right, we were learning more um, and, and the authors gave a couple uh, bits of advice on how to learn more. Um, <clears throat> and uh, talking about, you know, the first thing they mentioned was ad adopting a growth mindset and, and, um, as people in education, uh, I'm assuming that we all have heard of growth mindset. Is that, is that right? <clears throat> um, I, part of my uh, master's thesis was trying to figure out, trying to how to reference growth mindset in a, in a moral context. Um, there's one paragraph in a 2005 paper from Carol Dweck that mentions this can be applied elsewhere, but, um, so I think we've all heard of heard of growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And I guess my question is, how have you seen that in your, um, as you've engaged in learning more about whether it's within this particular book club or uh, in your um, career, um, you know, when have you noticed trying to use a growth mindset um, as helpful versus, you know, a fixed mindset? I know that I have some examples, but um, I'm just curious of, others, if you've been able to tell a difference between when you're able to use a growth mindset versus not. The first thing that comes to my mind is just that it's it's often I find it especially hard to have a growth mindset um, in initially getting into technical areas where it just seems like there are so many opportunities for um, I don't know bugs uh, or tedious mistakes or something like that that I've made and so I really have to work hard at um, at maintaining it. And some of the next topic probably bleeds into this, but um, finding lots of opportunities to practice at something and do something meaningful with it, or just keep plugging away at it or something. And once I get once I get going a little bit, I uh, I find it easier to maintain, and I see how the things that I've learned make it possible for me to learn more things and get you know nice feedback cycles and everything. But uh, it takes me a couple couple tries to get started sometimes. Um, I don't know, there's just a lot of opportunities to not know what's uh, going wrong if you don't also know how to find, you know, people to help you diagnose the issue or something like that. I like that point of, uh, of we can't, you know, we can iterate by ourselves, but it may not, we're kind of leading, we may be leading ourselves blindly um, at times. And that's, 
where kind of this learned helplessness might strike. Um, so yeah, I like that idea of having some good mentorship or good resources, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about, like, I think coding has helped me to have a growth mindset and just in terms of like trying to um, like iterate through things and trying things out. And if they, they work, then, then great. If they don't, then try a different way of doing it. And um, uh, I think one, one part of growth mindset is like maybe the result that you have isn't what your initial question was. Or like I've had like assignments where I've tried to follow um, what was asked for and struggled a little bit to find the right resources and then found like different R resources to do something else <laughs> that was that, that still kind of like um, resolved the assignment. And so it's like, you know, that's probably part of the growth mindset is like it, 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 with data analysis in general, right? Is that you're, you don't exactly know what you have right away, but as you're going along. So it's, there's that, the confidence to know that you're going to get there right and then also the ability to to be okay with the results and the direction changing so i don't know much about this growth and fixed mindset but, but i think i kind of get the idea so i think for me especially like saying i'm going to improve my data analysis skills or my coding skills is very you know it's very broad so what I like to do is I like to say, you know, I can work on my documentation. I can be much more thorough in like the way I document. So like, oh, you know, I'll be conscious about my documentation. And then, you know, once I feel comfortable with that, like move on to the next thing. I'm like, well, maybe some of my working on my joins and, you know, just figuring out specific areas that I can, you know, work on it for a little. And once I feel comfortable, move on to something else. So that way it's not like, well, I just want to improve my data analysis or like my coding skills because it's like what part of coding, what part of programming, what part of data analysis. And I think making it more, uh, you know, scalable and you can kind of build it on top of each other, I think is, is something that I try to do. Yeah, that sounds like the idea of a deliberate practice, um, which is uh, related to like, um, oh my word. What's his name? I can, I'm not quite, I can't quite remember his name, but this idea of expertise, um, 10 years or 10,000 hours, right? Um, where the way to get good at something is to identify what you need, what you need to work on, not keep practicing the same things that you're good at. Um, so um, that's, a, that's a good uh, relate, that, that relates to this idea of growth mindset a little bit too, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like this idea uh, both uh, of what you've, I think both Rob and Mike said, like the idea that um, having this, having this uh, just a change in your vision of how you code, um, using coding as, or you know, programming or whatever um, as an opportunity to learn and a challenge rather than, um, rather than just a task or just a, um, a, a checklist type of thing. I mean, sometimes it happens, but um, uh, yeah, that's that's helpful for me is to think of things as more as a puzzle. Eric, okay, I I, I want to say Eric Erickson, but that's um, he's a he's a identity researcher. But Erickson, it wasn't Andrew, Erickson. Anders Erickson. Thank you for, yeah, for expertise. Yes. So the question and is: Does he use R for code? Can we get an, our next book study? <laughs> I don't think he uses R. <laughs> um, but so then, then thinking about you know as we as we need as we want to iterate on our code and identify places where we can practice, um, uh, you know this next point of discovering new information. Um, and this is kind of I'm going to jump to chapter 18 a little bit here, um, but. They've, you know, the authors provide 13 different topics, uh, I think, or 12 different topics um, about different resources that they've um, curated. Um, is there like a go-to topic that you have when it comes to, let's just say R? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. So yeah, what, is there something that you, 
go to um maybe just generally that you when you want to learn something new in r or statistics or education or data science any one of those things <clears throat> they may be referenced in the book but you know, that's fine My biggest place is Twitter. I, um, you know, subscribe to our weekly and our bloggers. And when I see a particular tutorial that interests me or seems related to my interests or work, um, usually I just try it out and, and see what uh, the, the person who wrote it came up with. Yeah, I'll add to Isabella. Um, yeah. Twitter, which I never had before. I just created it a couple months ago just to follow all the R stat stuff because everyone's like, go to Twitter, go to Twitter. And I'm like, okay, I guess I gotta make a Twitter. But um, uh, I, I, to add to that, um, you know, I subscribe to get emails, you know, from different, different sources of people who code in R that sent out their blog posts or new videos and um, I try to read every single post on the R4DS community. Um, a lot of it I don't understand yet, um, but when something catches my eye of like, that looks, you know, I didn't know about that, but that could really help me, you know? So that's, that's kind of what I do is that it's not like one particular source. It's that I'm I'm trying to have all of these constant little feeds where, you know, something will catch my, you know, hopefully somewhere something will catch my eye and often does, right? I'm learning new things all the time. Um, but I also don't push myself that I need to understand like every single thing that's posted. That would be way too overwhelming. <laughs> it's just a, you know, the skimming through and seeing what catches my eye and what might be worth digging into. Something that I've came across, it's called bookdown.org. Um, there's a bunch of books on bookdown.org. There's like, I'll put it in the chat, but there's like, I think, and they're all the free the free books, but there's like introduction to data science, there's like the R graphics, there's book down, block down, and then there's like the main ones. And then there's like a bunch of other books that are, you know, by other people on like bio stats and what's so forth. And so sometimes I, I bring these up when I want to look something up specifically, but I think that one's, it is a beneficial one. I did that same thing a week ago or so. I scrolled through it and looked for all the ones that had covers. I figured those might be the ones that were finished. And then I bookmarked and organized them along with the bookmarks that I've been keeping from this uh, discussion where every week or so there's some, some books that people suggest, um, more than I can get through. Uh, our Twitter is so much nicer than other parts of Twitter. I was just getting like overwhelmed by the negativity of like political Twitter and that kind of thing and was kind of about to, to hang it up. And then uh, I, I kind of started following our related uh, accounts and it has nicely kind of slipped in there and um, taken some space away from the sniping. And my phone has also learned, I think my Google, like Google Now or whatever it is, is putting the our bloggers things in my, um, in my feed. So if I, if I don't find them myself, um, Google makes sure I, I see them. Yeah. I mean, I think the R for data science book itself has been a go-to for me personally. I was just looking at like the functions chapter because I didn't like read it front to back. Um, so then I'll go back to the sections that are relevant to me that I hadn't read yet. And yeah, I'll definitely check out this book down. I think, you know, I, I basically just have a folder in my browser where I'll like um, save free R books <laughs> when I come across them and might need them in the future, you know? And, and so I've got like a you know dozen or so there. And so yeah, it's kind of more by like just topic. Like if I wanna know about, you know, advanced, um, stats or something I'd go to the tidy might go to the tidy models book or something like that but uh, and then of course like uh, Julia Silgi and, and David Robinson's uh, 
screen uh, blog video blogs where they code through examples are phenomenal um, as well. Yeah, Do you have I, any tips for building a, a local network of people? Um, or is it mainly that you're in a network, you know, nationally with other people who are in these communities? Um, I, I can only speak to kind of the, an online community that I have. Um, you know, I, I use a lot of these same resources of Twitter. And, um, you know, I'm the only R user within my, like, uh, strict organization, I guess. Um, but I just found out this past weekend that there is a, a data science user group or our user group on my campus that I did not know about. And I, uh, I, uh, it's led by somebody who is a fellow student. And so I'm, I'm I talk to him about that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping to engage with a local community, especially as we return, um, uh, to in-person type things um, in the future. Um, but, you know, there's nothing, I don't think any major local things at my level. I know there's a lot of like K-12 stuff that they try to engage uh, children with coding and STEM work, but I don't think there's anything at kind of an adult level specifically for R. So, so I don't have any experience with that. Uh at least for me, um, there's Our Ladies, and um, a co-organizer on Our Ladies Seattle. There's also a local Seattle Use R group, um, and then also other like programming related uh, meetups. Um, if you've gone to the website meetup.com, there's there's at least in Seattle, there's like quite a few groups related to programming. Um, and then also the local conferences like Cascadia R, which is a, a conference in the at Pacific Northwest and things like that. Um, at work, there's not so much of a our community. Um, there's like four of us, <laughs> um, but that would be nice. Like every now and then we send each other like questions and things like that. So same, I, uh, I, I'm signed up for a lot of the Our Ladies meetups. Yeah, where uh, I, I get emails all the time about new, uh, you know, virtual get togethers. I can't make most of them, but occasionally I can. So that's why I'm, why I'm signed up for all of the reminders. Yeah, I've, I've looked up on how to create a, like an R user group. Um, and it doesn't seem like incredibly difficult, but then sustaining it is something that I unfortunately don't have time for, or I didn't have time for. Um, and so, um, and I'm trying to remember the site that you go to, but you can you can look up at what's available. You know what what user groups are out there. Um, some of them have their websites linked there that are active. Um, some of them have kind of um, retreated, I guess, during the pandemic or whatnot. But um, there there's quite a few out there that are like um, sponsored our user groups. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, <clears throat> But I think Meetup is is kind of where it's turning to, like the link that Isabella sent. So, like I'll follow Salt Lake. I'm from I'm from Salt Lake, and so Julia Silgi is in Salt Lake City, and I very interested in what she does and and the work that she brings um, to Salt Lake. So, <clears throat> um, great. Uh, so I I know we kind of covered kind of this ask for help. You know, we we can reach out to Twitter and, and stuff. But is I'm just curious. Is and and we mentioned a few people that we. Um, follow. Um, so then where do you share what you've learned? I know that's, that's part of the learning process, right, is then to um, share and, um, and more or less try and teach somebody. Um, so where do you typically share and, and how do you do with that? You know, for me, like I'll, I'll play with Tidy Tuesday data and I'll post some, you know, every, every, every other week, maybe I'll actually finish something. Um, and, and, uh, post something on Twitter or a LinkedIn group that I'm, you know, that I'm with a, a alumni there, but um, what do others do and how, how, you, how do you share your work and what you're learning? Well, 
Well, I need to get better at sharing. Um, so far, I've shared once in the wins and feedback in the R4DS uh, Slack channel, but I, I want to get better at sharing. It's just that um, all of my work's on private student data and I can't share that. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, I, I want to take the time to make up fake data to then, you know, generate my report with it. But I, I have to spend the time to make the fake data and I, I just haven't done that yet. Yeah, same. I, I, I mean, I, I assume most of us can't really share most of the steam things that we, that we work on. And so it's fun to play around with these public data sets that are, there's, I think, years worth of free data within the Tidy Tuesday GitHub um, account. And um, there was a talk at our studio global this, this past year um, by Alex, uh, his last name starts with a C. Um, where he talked about, um, you know, a fun thing to do for him is to find data sets and like try different things with different data sets. Um, so there's a lot of data out there. Um, maybe not exactly the one that, you know, could, you could mimic your report on, but um, yes, but then, but then finding time. I totally hear you. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out when on earth we're, where we'd have time to do all this. Um, Isabel, you, you, I know that, yeah, you have a, a blog and, and, and you mentioned Twitter. How do you keep up with um, blogging and, and, you know, what do you, when, when do you decide to share something? I'm curious about that. Yeah, um, I'm in the same boat. I can't really share anything that I do at work. Um, but every now and then, like, um, I, I come across like a data set that I found particularly interesting and, um, figured I could write a tutorial on. And then another thing which I really like about the um, art community is like, like people post stuff on like meta learnings, you know, like rather than like the actual output that they worked on, the things that they learn um, while doing a particular project and things like that. And I feel like, you know, that like that kind of documentation for me is very helpful in remembering like what on earth I, I learned about and, and did, um, but then also, um, you know, is hopefully like a, a useful reference for somebody else. Um, so even if like, I don't have time for a particular new analysis, um, like just trying to write up something that, that I've learned. And I, <laughs> I had my own personal goal of writing one blog post every quarter. <laughs> so, you know, trying to keep it a reasonable number that, you know, um, but keep it like consistent and, and, you know, set aside time to do. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and then this uh, last point of uh, uh, welcome others, right, as we become as we gain in knowledge, right, um, we, people will likely read our stuff or like our tweets or whatever, um, and just seeing finding ways in which they can continue to be engaged. Um, I know that's not like maybe our purpose, right? For um, for uh, you know what you see is you know you don't want to get more followers or whatever, but like engaging with people to, to continue to enhance the knowledge of yourself and to, to others, I think is a great opportunity for, for everyone. Um, <clears throat> something that I can continue to get better at, especially as I share more, so. <laughs> um, so uh, I think, was it, it was a couple of weeks ago when Josh uh, talked to us, um, and just kind of his thoughts on the book and, and Isabella can attest to this, like the book cat was very project-based, you know, it was very, you know, they wanted to do walkthroughs and they wanted to have a specific project. Um, and that's, I think a lot of the time how we learn, right? We have a particular project in mind. There's something we've got to do, whether it's uh, we found it or a manager told us to do it. Um, you know, besides kind of that project-based learning, you know, how, how else do you find time or motivation <laughs> Uh, to learn these new things um because we've mentioned a lot of resources now so what you know how do you engage with that learning 
besides a project. I think for me at work, it's sometimes new stuff, new things I learn come out of problems I notice at work. So like we usually have a report and like we would do the reports and like create tables and stuff like that. And I know the introduction of the GT package is like a new way of making tables. And so like, I think learning, I was like, well, there's this new package that I can use to, you know, introduce it into my current workflow and I think you know learning new bits and pieces that stem from your current problems or you know uh, learning how to integrate database connections because doing it the old method was very slow and very cumbersome and so I think you know using those problems as opportunities to learn in new packages or new skills I think is something that you know I think is an area that isn't project-based but that you can you know still continue to learn and then solve your problems. Yeah, that makes sense. I, 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 I realize I do the same thing. Like I've solved the problem, like, or the, the, I've done the project, but now I want to like make it more efficient or make it cleaner or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, great. <clears throat> so uh, jumping into chapter 19 here, um, that has some similar ideas and similar themes to uh, chapter 17 in kind of how we can continue to sustain our learning and, you know, how we can continue to um, kind of enhance data science and education. Um, so this, this first question may be, may be related to kind of what we uh, quickly discussed, you know, how do you identify a, a project or a problem that needs your attention that's related to education? Um, and I know that we're all in education. Um, and so how do you know it's something, oh, I need to solve this problem um, or, or get this project done? I listen. <laughs> I, I'm in, a, you know, I'm in several committees and um, I, I mean, even outside committees, but it's just most of the time in the committees since we're all not being face to face um is listening to what people are concerned about what they complain about and um you know uh, so that's that's where i get a lot of my projects is you know i i think about what what i've heard as you know pain points and uh, i think about what what can i do to uh, address it. And, you know, even some of that is, you know, there's a lot of complaining going on about this issue, but is it really an issue? Right? So then, then I, de I, I dive into exploring, okay, this, this is an issue, but how big of an issue is it? Um, and is it worth putting resources into it to try to fix this problem. Um, so that's that's where most of my projects come from, is just hearing uh, most of the time listening to a lot of complaining going on. <laughs> Sounds like you're a very proactive listener um, if you're identifying all these problems. Um, and I, uh, I'm, I'm curious then, um, you know, how, how do you then prioritize which ones, you know, need to get done or um, which ones can be solved using kind of the things that you know and are within your scope? Because, um, you know, from all of you, the more that I've learned about you, I'm, I'm very impressed with everything that you all do, but I, I know that we can't do everything, right? So like, how do you, what's, where's the scope that we have, you know, when identifying problems like this? Um, so I have two sounding boards uh, for 
for this, uh, I guess, because I'm, I'm the low man on the totem pole, which is fine. Uh, so I have a boss to report to, and any data I want has to come through institutional effectiveness. I, I don't have direct access to any data. I have to get it all approved um, through, through them because I'm not a part of their department. Um, so first I bring my idea to my direct boss who doesn't do any of this data science stuff, but she's amazing anyway. But I, you know, I say, I wanna do this, you know, and she helps me kind of set my priorities. And then I go to institutional effectiveness saying, I wanna do this. And they, um, I have a really good relationship with them. And they, they talk to me about, you know, what's feasible and what's not, and we can bounce some ideas, uh, you know, off of each other. So that's, those are my two resources to, to prioritize. And, um, you know, when I very first started, institutional effectiveness said, well, they should have never asked you for that. That's, that's something they should have asked us for. So I've, I've done a lot of passing on uh, data requests and analysis to them uh, when it's it's really their responsibility and not mine. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, my colleagues across campus feel intimidated to just ask institutional effectiveness, so they ask me instead, and then I just play messenger. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Others and how you uh, identify and prioritize things that need your attention within your work. I, I, I kind of agreed with Morgan. I have a good, good supervisor who helps me scope things out, yeah. Yeah, I think your supervisor is a strategy I take instead of saying, you know, I just ask, simply ask, you know, what's, where should I take my priority? And she could say, you know, do this and that. And I think to Morgan's point, so I'm an institutional, you know, effectiveness, institutional research or whatever. So the interesting, so like I have access to all the data. So sometimes that in itself can be a little bit overwhelming because like my boss gives me a lot of a leeway when it comes to like, I could actually, you know, explore different opportunities and like modeling because I can have all the access to the data. And I think that in itself is like a little bit overwhelming. So I think I think finding a, a identifying a problem and then you know kind of narrowing that and talking to other people I think can can really be helpful instead of saying I want to do something with this data when in reality I have access to all the data and that is that's a lot to think about especially with an institution at my size I can only imagine an institution like Notre Dame where it's massively bigger and I think it's just figuring out a problem and you know seeing if it's a good problem and kind of narrowing it and then going from there, I think is, is a good strategy. Great. Um, so the next point in, in uh, what I suggest is learning to collaborate with others. Oh my word, there are lots of children here. Um, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but we're learning to collaborate with others here. And, uh, <clears throat> I, the re, so the, the, this first question of, uh, do you have an education related data science question that you'd help with? I'm selfish and I do have one. I don't know how to um, scrape web pages. Um, and there's a, there's a education related um, data that's you know, public education. Um, and I'm not asking for help like right this minute, but I would love advice on how to scrape uh, websites. Um, and so, so that's the type of, you know, that's, that's a question that, that somebody asked me and they're like, oh, hey, you're in a data science program. Can you do this for us? I was like, I, I will try that. Um, and so that's something that I'm still working on and, uh, have tried to figure it out on my own, but I need help. Um, <clears throat> so others who have the, kind of these questions or have been asked questions, but you're just kind of stuck and you need, uh, someone's help or someone's advice um, and maybe we can do a quick uh, uh, quick guidance on on what you can do <laughs> is the arvest package is that the one that's tidy 
tidy related. Can you say the name of that again? Arvest, R-V-E-S-T, I think is the, is like the tidyverse related um, oh. web scraping. I did a brief module on web scraping on data quest a few months ago, but I don't have uh, a whole lot of functional knowledge on it. There's one on there if you feel like uh, subscribing for a month. Yeah, it, using our best. I think in, I've done it here and there for my friend, but I think First of all, I say dude on Chrome. I think it's much more friendly on Chrome. And I know on Chrome, there's an attachment called selector gadget, which is like a wonders because you do need some, some knowledge on like HTML, CSS, but like selector gadget, you just click what you want and it like returns um, like the, uh, what is it called? Like the anchors or the tags, the tags, and then you can just plug that into RBS. So a selector gadget, I think, will do wonders for you, but I think, yeah, that's my, and I think there's a couple of blog posts out there. If I can find them, I think were very helpful when I was doing it. Any other, I, I, thank you for all that help. I, I'm now curious if I can help others <laughs> um, in suggesting some resources or, or whatever. If, if, if somebody has a, task or something or workflow that they're getting stuck on it's not something i'm stuck on but distant future dream i would love to figure out how to get a shiny application offline like so not using shiny.io right which you have to go online for but something more like that's installed on your desktop sort of thing. <laughs> I, I don't know how possible that is, um, but that's, that's something I, I would like to know if it's possible to launch shiny applications without the internet, <laughs> With, without having R installed. So, so kind of both those things, like not having R installed, but you can use shiny without the internet. <laughs> uh, that's something I'd like to know um, because my my boss would like me to do kind of like a, uh, a, a customer dashboard type of thing. And she's like, well, why don't you use Excel? And I'm like, oh, that hurts me inside to use Excel. I mean, I, I know, uh, my my husband um, used to do Excel macros, right? So he he knows how to do it, and I we got a big old textbook at home that t that tells me how to do that. But I don't want to. I'd rather pursue shiny, yeah, yeah. Flex dashboard is something something created by R, but then if I want to share right, with colleagues at my institution that they don't have to install R, they can just install the Flex dashboard on their computer. And I don't want it online because it'll have student data, right? I want it behind our institution's firewall. That's my concern. So I, I have no idea. I don't know if that's possible. See, I, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out the same thing, whether it's authenticated in our shiny using with, with IT's help with like using SSO um, or I have a friend who says, oh yeah, I use flex dashboards within the business school. And it's like, wait, how do you do that? Cause you're passing along like student data, like tell me more. So I've heard people do it, but I have no idea, no idea. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you.
Well, there's a couple other things that I do want to talk about. So uh, if, if you do have other questions, we are now a completed cohort. We should use a Slack channel to our advantage. Um, um, and if you do have questions, hopefully you can find some help there. But um, <clears throat> uh, also just wanted to note that um, we do want to learn, you want to learn to collaborate with yourself. Um, so that this is something that I've learned to get better at is like documenting my code and um, being better um, uh, at writing out code comments so that when I come back two months later, I know what I'm, I know what I was trying to do. Um, and so that I think relates to learning to every time we code is write it out a little bit and <clears throat> think about it through. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we're gonna jump ahead just for a second here um, and, and kind of speculate on the future. Um, and because these last couple chapters, they really talked about like what we can do as individuals in learning and engaging with data science and education. But what's something kind of, um, you know, systemically or uh, um, within, the, within a bigger context of what data science um, can become and specifically data science and education? What would you like to see in the next three to five years um, within these kind of two, two uh, related aspects? I think the um, the Department of Ed and the federal one has gotten like an influx of, of funding to do things around data. And I'm really curious to see how everything plays out and, you know, what we learn and what they're able to like share out to um, other education related organizations. And I know like there's like a focus on machine learning specifically, like um, also things like embedding equity. And, um, yeah, I'm just like really excited for all that work to kick off and um, hopefully see it like across the different sectors in, in education. I saw that, I saw that too. Also, I think California is thinking about adding in data science in their high school curriculum, but that means they have to modify or remove a course. And there's, there's talk, like there's some big discussion about, you know, well, what would you remove? Would you remove statistics? But it's like, but statistics is kind of part of data science. So um, there is, yeah, I've heard that there's some states that are considering what they include in their curriculum. <laughs> so. I, so as uh, I, I feel like there's kind of, uh, several different ways in which you can break up education. There's like K-12 education and there's higher education. That's one way to think about it. Um, and there's like teaching and learning about data science. And then there's using data science within education. What are your thoughts on those different ways in, in how things can break out? Because in higher ed, there's just a lot. Mm, never mind, scratch that idea. Um, but in, uh, you know, there's different ways that we can look at data science and education uh, and how, the, how those could break out. Any thoughts on, on that? Um, I agree with you, um, especially on separating <laughs> um, teaching data science versus like the institutional research, right? I, uh, at least I feel like I often see like birds of a feather groups for networking where you, you kind of, they've only kind of separated out education for teaching, edu teaching. Um, and um, so specifically R, right, was te teaching R in an educational setting and um, using R like, I, as more as like your research using, using our <laughs> educate, you know, um, and I don't know, I feel like institutional research has kind of been left out. I've seen at, at least in, in things I've tried to participate in, they, they have a group for education, 
but I feel like the only two things that are being acknowledged are teaching and academic research, which institutional research doesn't really fall under academic research. Like it sounds like it should, but uh, at least from what I've seen, it really doesn't. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, my experience too. <clears throat> I think for me in institutional research, you know, when I came into the position in 2018, I feel like there's been curiosity to see what data science, you know, especially R can do and what capabilities it has, because, you know, traditionally everything's been done in, you know, Excel or it's been done in, you know, SQL, though those, those are beneficial, I think. I think the great thing about ours is the, the ecosystem, the ability to work within it. So I think there has been some growing curiosity to say, you know, what capabilities can we use with R in terms of like just querying data just in general or connecting to databases or even modeling, or even if you want to go as far as like using dashboards and stuff like that. So I think there's been a, for me personally, I think there's there's been a, you know, with the other community colleges here, there's been a growing curiosity, but I think there's a little bit of hesitation within, you know, my peers on, we've been ingrained in the system of using SQL and using these other programs, but I don't, I think the best way to show them the power is to really, you know, demonstrate it with, you know, here's a dashboard, here's a shiny dashboard, you know, here's the reporting that you can do in R and everything like that, I think. I think it really, it, it is powerful, especially with my boss of like, you know, there is some hesitation in R because it's it's programming and it's coding and it, it looks difficult. But I think if you demonstrate to them what, what you can do with it and how much it can, you you know, reinvent a workflow that is sometimes, you know, can be bogged down in repetitive things to something that is more efficient and more reproducible and, you know, saves everybody time and everything like that. Yeah, isn't I mean, that's kind of one of the bigger overarching um, goals of, of data science. I think is like automating what can be automated, or or making more efficient uh, what what can be made more efficient. Um, yeah, interesting. So, uh, so another another way or another thing that's at the intersection of the teaching data science and then using data science to analyze teaching. We haven't talked much about students analyzing their own learning. So you could, but there are, there are learning analytics communities that are more student focused. Um, whereas I don't think any of the chapters were really about this. They were about education, about data science, right? But, but not necessarily kind of taking responsibility for your own learning and monitoring your your progress and reflecting on what you're, you know, using data tools to analyze your own learning, sort of like quantify itself, you know, that kind of world a little bit, but um, there are communities with that in education. So just to say that that's another thing that could sit at the, at the gap between those um, two divisions. Um, is that something that, um... I mean, it sounds like it's kind of happening or there, there's kind of a, a, an area of research, you said learning analytics. Is that something that would be enhanced with data science courses for students, do you think? Um, it, it could be. I mean, I don't, so, so what I was just describing is not equal to learning analytics, I don't think, but it's I, the people at UNC who do learning analytics are in a community called self-regulated learning, which is like one branch of, Ed Psych, um, and so their take on it is is in that direction. Um, and you could do self-regulated learning without without and uh, uh, without skills in R. But I think it could be. I think you could benefit from the ability to analyze your own learning if you had more data. If you had a better way of uh, analyzing or, or, or sorry, collecting data about your own learning, right? And there have been some efforts to 
make educational data more kind of learner centered or make it travel with the learner, give you access to your own data? I don't know. I think probably more likely is that people would just analyze it using other other tools, but you know, you could use it as an opportunity to get people more sophisticated ones. Yeah, somewhat related to what Rob's saying, uh, I just had a conversation with my boss about in the future, figuring out how to per, um, have these conversations with our students about how we're using their data, right? We, we have this data that we're gathering on them and how we're using it um, just to, you know, establish more transparency, but also, you know, in the work that I'm doing, um, part of what I'm doing is evaluating um, programs that we have on campus and how effective they are for helping our students persist. And, you know, having that conversation of if we share with the students how we're using our, their data and what results we're getting, you know, can we help convince the student, you know, using data that they should be participating in these activities to help them. I like that idea. I, I, that's really interesting. And that's, I think, something that relates to chapter four uh, from this book um, in having to, you know, consider, you know, special considerations of, of education. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that there's, a voice uh, and the hopefully continued voice of, you know, making sure that we're intentional and transparent and accountable um, in how we use data science and stuff, especially, you know, for all the stakeholders. So, um, so we're going to turn quickly, oh, it's six o'clock. Um, just really quickly, um, I think I just want you to reflect maybe over the next week. Um, you know, what has been kind of this one takeaway from reading this book? Um, and, you know, this may be your chance to use Twitter and say like, hey, I just finished this book club and this is my one takeaway from this book. You know, check it out. Um, or come join the Slack where we're going to continue the conversation or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, take some time and think about even just, just one thing. Um, and because uh, we unfortunately don't have... Too much time right now but um same with this question um maybe you can reflect on this one as well is you know is there one thing that you want somebody to learn um when they're using r or doing stats or data science generally or working in education um just i'm just trying to get ideas of how we can engage with the community but um you know this is something that you can think about um later so uh, and this may also be something that we can share either in chat or in the, in our the Slack channel. You know, as we hope that there's another cohort. Um, I see that there's like 79 members in Slack, um, and and I know that many of them aren't able to come at this time. Um, but what's what's some advice that we could give them for those who may join the next uh, book club cohort? Um, uh, whether that's written in chat or, or recorded here, um, or maybe take some time to think about that and, and then add it to the Slack channel. Um, but any, any quick advice on, you know, what you would like to see in the next book club cohort? I know what I wish I would have done personally is in those walkthroughs. Um, I wish I would have challenged myself more to like try to change it or improve it, you know, because this book doesn't have exercises like some of the other R, R books do. Um, but uh, as much as the walkthroughs were really helpful in learning new things, um, you know, I challenged myself to either accomplish the same thing using a different method or just in make one change to improve it or, you know, some, something along those lines of, uh, you know, not, not just reading through it, but trying to actively think through adding, con you know, contributing something myself.
cool. Yeah, I know I, I know I gave you, I feel like I'm giving you homework, but <laughs> please don't, please don't uh, take it away. And this is just a time to reflect, right, on, on this experience that we've had together um, reading, reading this book. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're gonna do hags like they did in uh, middle school. Have a great summer, right? Um, and hope you have, uh, you know, really, you know, enjoy your summer. And, uh, you know, again, thank you so much for everything that you all have done. Um, and hopefully we can continue to, to um, collaborate and participate in the Slack channel and elsewhere. So um, I'm gonna give you all a round of applause. Thank you for participating. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ryan, for getting this started. And it's been a real pleasure walking through the book with you. Um, and I've learned so much, so thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.